In 2007, George W. Bush put together an immigration plan that had been derailed uh, largely by the small but vocal minority in the Republican Party that really, I sense, opposed immigration in general. Where does that group stand now? I, I know that the uh, opinion that uh, anti-immigrant sentiments, I guess, are fairly weakly held, but now that this is at the forefront, is that group going to derail, uh, in your view, this immigration plan? It has the potential to do so, but something big happened between then and now, and that was the 2012 election. It was a complete epiphany for a lot of Republicans to realize that a growing part of the electorate was simply tuning them out because of the hostile tone on immigration. So even though we have some of the same folks there, we're seeing greater receptivity to the idea of comprehensive immigration reform. I spoke with Emily Eakins, who's a research fellow here, and she also uh, directs uh, polling at the Reason Foundation. And uh, her polling has found that people's opinions on immigration can hinge on what they feel the impacts of immigration are on businesses in the United States. But I haven't really seen a lot of evidence that uh, politicians have really taken up that idea and run with it. By and large, most people think that immigrants are good for the economy. They also very strongly care about the rule of law and they don't like to see people coming illegally. So I think that politicians would do well if they adopted a program uh, of legal immigration that served our economy well, uh, for example, increasing the number of high-skilled visas that are issued, and uh, that set a fair system that will be enforced consistently. I think there's strong public support for that, even if you provide a path to citizenship for people who came illegally. Of the widely discussed plans that have been uh, circulated over the last few months, what do you think are the biggest weaknesses in terms of the plans, both from a policy perspective and uh, for gaining popular support? The Gang of Eight plan is, I think, remarkably good considering that it has uh, fingerprints on uh, from both parties and it's a very, very long and complex bill, but it gets a, a lot of the immigration dilemma right. Um, the major weakness, in my view, is where the unions have really had their biggest influence, and that is limiting the number of guest workers that we desperately need for parts of our economy, such as construction, agriculture, tourism, that sort of thing. And they're intentionally kept low um, because of unions' concerns that, uh, that there will be undercutting of wages and that sort of thing. I think that's the major flaw in the Gang of Eight proposal and one that could very easily be remedied in the House because it's quite clear that the Democrats want immigration reform, and if that's the price for it, I think they're, they're going to be willing to pay for it. Uh, some critics of the plan that has been put forth by the Gang of Eight, uh, most especially Robert Rector at the Heritage Foundation, have argued that uh, entitlements are really the key here. And uh, for example, they've argued that for the next, I believe, five decades, this will cost many trillions of dollars to our uh, entitlement programs. What is your assessment of those ideas? Well, the Cato Institute, among others, has done a tremendous job in debunking the heritage study, which doesn't look at any of the positive contributions that immigrants make. Immigrants are far more likely to start businesses than native-born Americans. They're far more likely to have intact families. They're far more likely to come here to work and in their most productive working years. And they're also more, far more likely to have kids who will not be collecting Social Security for quite some time. So I think overall, the, the net benefit to the economy is tremendous, especially for high-skilled visas, which uh, we have many too few of. Uh, and countries like Canada are issuing more high-skilled visas than, than we are. High-skilled workers create jobs. In addition to their own jobs, studies show that they create four to five 
more jobs uh, downstream from, from the kinds of, of skills that they provide. So uh, there is no question that immigrants have a net benefit to the economy. What we ought to emphasize in immigration reform is encouraging the right kind of immigrants, mainly young, hardworking people, and that is 180 degrees from the system that we have right now, which emphasizes family preferences over work-based immigration. What are the prospects, do you think, of changing both high-skill and low-skilled uh, worker visa allotments right now? I think that the prospects are very good to increase the number of high-skilled visas. First of all, a lot of other countries are competing with us and out-competing us. Chile now has Chilicon Valley uh, because it's so easy for people to open businesses there and to immigrate legally. Canada has one-tenth our population and yet issues more high-skilled visas than we do. As a result, we're seeing companies like Microsoft opening facilities on the Canada side of the U.S. border. We can't afford to let that happen anymore. We're also graduating incredibly skilled people from our colleges and universities and waving goodbye as they take their skills to other countries. So uh, I think that there is a tremendous pent-up demand and it's probably the issue on which more people agree than any other issue is increasing the number of high-skilled visas. I think we also have a consensus on a guest worker program for uh, lower-skilled workers. Seeing what happened in Alabama and Georgia when illegal immigrants were sent packing and even though the farmers wa raised the wages that they were paying, they could not find native-born Americans to fill those jobs. As a result, we are exporting um, agricultural jobs to foreign countries and uh, we're losing a great uh, part of our economy. So I think that there's consensus on both of those points. As far as the low-skilled visas are concerned, the big issue is the numbers and the unions are fighting to keep the numbers as low as possible. There's another issue here with labor regulations of, associated with guest workers who come to the United States. For a lot of would-be employers, they are told that they must provide housing, that they must provide uh, cooking utensils, that they must provide uh, several other things, and then uh, and a whole lot of regulatory baggage comes along with that, which seems to be another yet another discouragement to um, hiring uh, guest workers. Is there anything that you've seen to get rid of sort of the required uh, regulatory structure that goes around hiring these workers? Well, the unions certainly are trying to make it as expensive as possible to, f to hire foreign workers. And uh, frankly, the business community and the, the farmers have been willing to pay those rates because they can't find workers otherwise. But at some point, of course, it becomes too expensive and will simply lose those jobs altogether. This is where I think the House of Representatives has the biggest opportunity to make constructive change to the Gang of Eight bill, and that is uh, by getting rid of the regulations that will make hiring immigrants more costly than hiring domestic workers. And it's imperative that they do so because domestic workers simply won't take those jobs. The jobs will go away.